Welcome to Big Blend Radio, where we celebrate variety and how it adds spice to quality of life. People were on the street. Suddenly I can see this really high water. And I just like, what is that? The 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami was like no other. It was equivalent to 23,000 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs. I remember the feeling of the wave passing on my face. It's like immense force. And then once I resurfaced, I screamed out for mom and dad and just heard nothing. Everybody lost somebody. This elderly couple were hanging on to a railing. I tried to reach them. And they just disappeared. Nearly a quarter of a million people left this planet in one day. But I saw hundreds of acts of heroism. I forgot about my fear. I could not say no to everyone calling for help. You're a good girl. You're a strong girl. When things are at their darkest, when somebody is in trouble, people want to help. That is the wonderful power of the human spirit. Welcome, everyone, to Big Blend Radio's Nature Connection podcast. Um, you know, there is a brand new series coming out on National Geographic starting November 24th. And it's a far, four part document, uh, I should say, docuseries. It's called Tsunami Race Against Time. And uh, many of us are going to remember what happened in 2004 when the Indian Ocean tsunami really took out over 230,000 people passed through this. It was massive. And when you watch this, it just, the scope of this tsunami is is insane. And watching it, I just watched all four episodes. You know, we've been on the other side. And we were in 2003, we were in the Cedar Fire in San Diego, which was one of the largest wildfires um, at that time for California. And this had happened right after, and it was just kind of like a, wow, all these disasters, but um, also looking at earthquakes and how all of that works. So today, very excited to have Barry Hershorn join us. You'll see him in the documentary. He is a seismologist. That's a big word for me, Barry, but welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks. <laughs> and I, you know, your work in that, um, you know, going back to 2004, I was thinking about this you know, we have all these disasters, hurricanes and everything. Obviously, this year has been pretty rough with that and wildfires. But a tsunami is not what people kind of put it in the back of their mind, right, of what it is. And maybe you think, oh, a tidal wave or one big wave. But watching this really showed what I didn't get it from the news when this happened. Like I didn't get I, I understood how bad it was and how many people and I didn't actually even think 230,000. That's a lot. Um, but I didn't get the extent of it, like it, the way it moved, the tsunami and the the multiple waves. Like it was just like you think you're safe to go out again, and you're not because another wave is coming. Is that the difference between a tsunami and a tidal wave? Is the number of waves? Uh, the the difference between a tsunami wave and a tidal wave is fundamentally a completely different paradigm. The okay, um, um a uh. A um, a regular wave that we're used to seeing breaking on is is essentially only involving the surface of the ocean. So when you're at the coast or or even on the ocean, you see surface waves, waves on the surface breaking, and they can be pretty horrific. But they're but the energy is generated by water close to the surface, you know, the upper surface of the ocean. 
A tsunami, on the other hand, involves essentially is is water moved by land motion due to an earthquake mm. at the bottom of the ocean. So you're moving, if you will, the entire ocean column. Wow. So so if you're talking, for example, about I don't know, take a number. If you've got a a um, hundred km, if you got a um, pick a say 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers deep or you know 10 miles deep 15 20 miles deep and you've got all the water above it is also being moved up not just the surface wow. in addition to that you're not talking about just one point or one column of water in the case of this earthquake you're talking about a series of uplifts of the entire ocean bottom propagating for a distance larger than the length of California. That was crazy. Bit by bit as the fault underneath the seafloor is rupturing to the north, north, uh, mm. northwest. Like this was like, you know, bigger than the California coastline, which is massive, you know, for yeah. for this. Well, yeah. And if you're imagining these columns of ocean water, which themselves are quite deep, right? So yeah. you're, you're basically lifting, say, a column of ocean water a column of ocean water that I don't know is miles thick up meters you know three four wow. feet then then and then on top of that you're propagating that moving that moving column of water is now you know a little ways to the north another ocean the entire ocean and this whole ocean bottom lifting if you will of all the water on top of it is propagating up along a long Mm -hmm. pseudo linear trend in this case of sumatra uh the length of california or larger you know wow and it so was... that's a tremendous amount of energy and once that energy goes up into the air it has to come back down and when it comes back down it starts spreading out from that point as a tsunami in both directions so that's why it was going in yeah because when i was watching how they were showing how it was going i was like wow it's going in two different ways and and then just how it was curving it had its own like it was like making its own you know this wasn't yeah. like a one direction at all no and in the case i mean it was yeah i mean it's one of the very 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 rare cases of a tsunami that and that that kills people across an entire ocean basin many hours later Another example of that, by the way, is what is supposed to eventually happen along our west coast, our northwest coast, the Cascadia region, mm -hmm. is also due for such a gigantic earthquake. It could break in smaller earthquakes like eights, only eights. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. But, but a number of eights. But it could also break as one, in which case it would be like, it wouldn't, it could be com you know, comparable to the 04 event. Wow. Because I know I've been to Crescent City and um, up in Northern California, and they yeah, I know they they know about tsunamis there, um, but you know, so you're you're out there and you're like, I don't know, man, don't do it. <laughs> you know, it's it's scary, but it is scary. But this one thing I wanted to ask, um, and then talk a little bit more about you know how this you know happens. People may watch this and go, Hey, um, this is all climate change, right? So this is a little different. This is not a climate change occurrence. This is something natural, right? So you're saying like one is coming due. Um, but the the extent of this, like, do we have more warning systems now? To, you oh, know, well, we're that much was, better off now. Yeah. Um, basically, yeah. basically, that event sparked a revolution in seismology and oceanography, mm. which has resulted now. In fact, even by the time of the big Japanese earthquake, there was already what that was in eleven. So there have been seven years, six or seven years. There were already major, major changes that mitigated that disaster somewhat, luckily. But now we're we have all sorts of I mean, that's what I do is is Yeah, yeah. You're yeah, amazing is, yeah, watching is, what is, you were doing. Yeah, I was just, um I mean that's what we I mean, you know, I try to do is to concentrate on the closest coasts and what can I and what can we learn about the actual earthquake and its potential for a tsunami very quickly and very accurately. So we can protect the closest coastlines, which are where most of the casualties occur. Mm. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah. that was crazy. And everybody was saying how, because people didn't even know, like here it was coming. They didn't know what it even was. 
And then they were seeing black, like just about all the footage people were saying it was like a black sea coming in, how it was so dark, you know, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. was interesting, you know, to me listening, you know, and watching the documentary, how many people just saw it was really dark and it was dark water. It was brown even when you could see it go in through the communities, you know, it was different from the flooding part, you know. Right, because by then it's dragging along quite a bit of mud, debris, partial yeah. buildings, who knows, cars, whatever. It's going to be pretty dirty at that point. By the time mm. it turns around and comes out, it's even worse. Mm. Yeah. In fact, that's what? Funny. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that's another of many dangers of these huge tsunamis is that even if you're in the water and floating, you've got all these debris floating with you that can knock you out, slice you up, do it, you know, whatever. So, you know, yeah. some people were able to get on top of things and float it out. Anyway. That was, it was, it's so depressing to see what happened with people. And then the stories of humanity, like really coming out and saving each other's lives were just amazing. I mean, it, it it's kind of a tearjerker. I'm just going to say to people yeah. watching this, and it's yeah. a real story, you know, it was really well done and using footage that people had from their vacations. Here they were on, you know, a Christmas holiday, you know, that's not a fun thing, you know, uh, no. to go through. It's like, no, um, you know, it, it, but it's a really scary thing. And I was thinking about, you know, travelers like, oh, you know, we're going on vacation, just arrived. And all of a sudden this happens and you don't even have your bearings in the communities like the locals do. You and know. in this case, the locals didn't really know what they should be doing either. And there was no civil defense authorities to guide them. And there was no warning center to give them a warning. Yeah. So it was zero for three as far as the components you need to, you know, nothing, you know, operating. We were operating, you know, with blinders on. I mean, no, no tsunami, well, one tsunami gauge that we were getting data from the entire Indian Ocean near Australia. Uh, some seismometers, but nowhere near enough. No one to contact, you know, you know, as I, I guess this all comes through in the movie too. And mm -hmm. no, one, no one to actually contact, no civil defense authorities, no trained public uh, who that would know essentially what to do. No, essentially no trained public that would know what to do, you know, mm. like coastlines. Um, you just nothing there. Yeah. That's one. And, thing. and also the, the, the media, yeah. the media had a hard time too. CNN trying to actually get, you know, their phones were down, everything was down, which is what happens in these kinds of disasters. I know that from being in the fires and hurricanes, like know that things aren't gonna work. Your phones very often aren't gonna work. You know, electricity goes down, things go down, you can't get gas in your car, you know, things like that happen. And it was so, you know, I felt like I was reliving being in the fires watching it because that feeling of complete helplessness. And then from you guys must have been just like, what do we do? But don't panic because you have to think clearly with the data, right? And be able to. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You have to, uh, you really have to be thinking about the places that haven't been impacted yet by the wave and concentrate on what you can do for those places. And we, you know, we had a very helpful tool for that. The director of the warning center on the fly threw together what we call a tsunami travel time map. And so we had in our hands. Uh, a tool that enabled us to focus on the places that hadn't been impacted yet, instead of mm -hmm. spending what little energy and resources we had on folks mm -hmm. that already impacted. So that was very mm -hmm. valuable. And just constantly trying to calm down and think about all the information that you need and what you can learn that will tell you what you can do for places downstream if you can get through to them. We did get a big lucky break. I don't, that may be later in the series. I don't know how many, who you did, but um, we got a very big lucky break, much too late. But by the, by something like seven hours after the earthquake, when the way the tsunami wave was already just beginning to hit Madagascar, um, the uh, State Department um, 24 hour op, uh, Office of Operations called us. And that was really good news for us because it. Um, and I picked up the call and basically, mm. and afterwards they set up a conference call, but they set up a conference call with all of our uh, embassies and a lot of the places that had not yet been impacted, like mm. Africa, maybe Madagascar, Mauritius. Yeah, Nairobi was in there, my old hometown. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. 
Nairobi. Mombasa, you went, no, you went, yeah, yeah, Nairobi area. And Mombasa was where we went vacationing all the time. Oh boy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh boy. So yeah. And uh, Kenya, they got lucky. Somalia. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we were able to say, okay, well, you know, please don't just relay this to your embassy counterparts. Please ask your embassy people to relay it to your local authorities because they're the ones who can potentially get out and help the public. So that was a big break in that we may have, apparently it, it was somewhat effective for Kenya. Mm, yes, that's what I saw. It, yeah, oh, although for Somalia, I don't know, there was, you have a choice. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of people with machine guns running around, it, which is the greatest danger. And, yeah. Uh, but on, but uh, Kenya and, um, and I think some of the other places and at least I hope and well, Africa. with with I was thinking too with this, you know, at that time, you know, internet wasn't like what it is now, right? We didn't have all the systems, you know. I know that the medical world they're trying to get, like during COVID, they realized they didn't have like a central system for all of us medically to know, like, you know, do they have pre uh, existing conditions or is it just COVID? You know, and you know they were talking about creating more of a central system for health. So that when an epidemic or a pandemic happens, that um, hospitals can communicate with each other and understand their patients better and, right. you know, their background. Right. So a lot of times people were deemed as COVID, but it might have been COVID or not COVID just because of what they had. Right. And so and how to treat somebody, you know, what their pre-existing condition is. So now, like when I was looking at, you know, 2004, I think we were just at high speed then internet, but we didn't have what we have now, right? So it's the internet where we're at now with technology and even AI. I don't know about AI and seismology. Do you guys use it? <laughs> it's being used, it's being used, but with care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole other topic, but, but well, is yeah. that now yeah. helping yeah. from what you guys all learned from that to yeah. develop more of a warning system that people can, you know, get to higher ground and away from the coastline. Yeah, yeah. And I think probably, I mean, the most important thing I could, that I could probably say, I think, is that regardless of everything else, if if you're near a coast line somewhere and you feel the ground shake fairly strongly and you suspect it as, a, you know, the ground shakes pretty strongly, um, that you should simply take after you're done protecting yourself from the earthquake. I would advise to immediately just, yeah. you know, pretend you're just getting some exercise. It doesn't matter if it's if there's no tsunami, but just get some exercise and walk. Especially nowadays, you'll know fairly quickly whether it's real or not because of you say internet and earthquake early warning systems and technology and all sorts of stuff. Tsunami warning centers, you'll know, you know, within a relatively short time. Um, that you can come back if it's not mm. tsunami, but at least if you're on, if you're standing by the coast or near the coast and you feel the strong ground shaking, I would simply go inland. I mean, especially if mm. yes, simply go inland. You know, mm. just just walk up. If depending where you are, you may be able to get to thirty or forty feet elevation or not. But you know, strive for getting to higher elevation. You know, think mm. of it. As, you know, think of it as an excuse for exercise when you haven't got time to go to the gym. <laughs> but I love that. <laughs> so I so, so, so basically you just get that exercise up the hill, find out within an hour at most that it's not a tsunami and come back down. If it is mm -hmm. one, it could save your life. And yeah. and um if you don't feel strong, sharp, strong, but you do feel somewhat shaking, followed by longer period. Not as sharp, but kind of like that in that longer period. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, more time between the the up and down, the shaking. Um, if you feel that for an extended period of time, like twenty or thirty seconds, even if the strong shaking isn't strong, I would also move and land for that one. Okay, great information. Thank yeah. you so much, Barry, for joining us. Everyone, again, uh, this series uh, premieres November 24th on National Geographic called Tsunami Race Against Time. Thank you Thank so you much for listening for to Big all Blend your work Radio. You Keep up with our shows us. at BigBlendRadio.com.